Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Shame is debilitating. It ruins relationships, thwarts growth, and destroys hope. It can masquerade as various problems, guilt, envy, pride, resentment, but until you heal the core issue, freedom will remain out of reach. After 25 years of research, our next, next guest has discovered that sin is a response to shame, and once dealt with, can bring remarkable transformation to even the most troubled among us. Dr. Mark Baker has received a PhD in clinical psychology and a master's degree in theology, as well as a certificate in psychodynamic psychotherapy. He serves as the executive director of the Levy Counseling Centers in Pasadena and Santa Monica, California. He's the author of several books, including Jesus, the Greatest Therapist Who Ever Lived, which has over two million copies in print, Spiritual Wisdom for a Happier Life, How Your Eight Key Emotions Can Work for You, and You Can Change, Stories from Angola Prison and the Psychology of Personal Transformation. You can learn more about him at drmarkbaker.com. Joining us now, as he does on the second Friday of every month at the 12 o'clock hour, is the author of Overcoming Shame, let go of others' expectations and embrace God's acceptance is our good friend, Dr. Mark Baker. Mark, welcome to your edition of Revealing the Truth, Overcoming Shame. Very good to see you. I always look forward to our conversations. I do. I do as well. Uh, <clears throat> these are troubling, vexing times. I, I, I sent you a uh, reminder the other day. Uh, as I always do, a couple of days before the program, just saying, don't forget you're on, and uh, here's some thoughts, and let me get your thoughts. And uh, I wrote this statement to you. I said, confusion, delusion, despair, uncertainty, fear, and anxiety are overtaking so many. What to do? Nothing is stable. Everyone's a suspect. How do we navigate this nationally certifiable litany of spiritual and psychologically impactful stimuli? And your response was, as well, now we have the topic of Friday's show. Right, we have our topic. You're right. Now we have our topic. It's the state of affairs now, and it's quite concerning, quite concerning for me as a psychologist when I look at the things that are being said, the things that are being believed, the way people are coping with the fear and anxiety. And I liked the, the use of the word delusion. Uh, we latch on to beliefs that we think are real in a way to deal with fear in life. And uh, our work with, uh, with psychotic patients often is working with what we call delusions and hallucinations where they fabricate uh, uh, ideas about how reality goes. You know, they, they hear the radio is talking to them, they, they uh, see little green men. Uh, it is a way of, of concretizing or making concrete our fears in life. Not just psychotic people do that. Uh, we now, we might say, we now have a psychotic nation on our hands where people are creating fictitious uh, uh, ideas, beliefs, scenarios, narratives, in order to deal with their fears. And they believe they're true, uh, just as every schizophrenic I've talked to in a mental hospital does. They believe they're true. I've talked to Jesus many times in mental hospitals, and he believed he was Jesus. Uh, often, they, they um, even if they're Jewish, they, they imagine that they're Jesus Christ because it's a persecutory symbol, right? People are trying to get me, they persecute me, they're gonna crucify me, I must be in my delusion, that person, the object of, of, of persecution. We've got a whole nation that's doing that now. Uh, we, we seriously need to have these conversations to see if we can get underneath these belief systems that are fictitious and they're ways of trying to deal with fears that are, are, taking, us, are taking us over. These fears are taking us over. So I'm, I'm welcoming these conversations. You know, on one hand, we have a media that says that we have a mental health crisis, and on the other hand, we have a media that is causing a mental health crisis. Absolutely true. And the role they play as the protagonist in this drama 
in fueling what they know will bring in ratings and feed the financial coffers is driving people to anxiety, to uh, despair, to suicide, and there is no sense of responsibility. There's only this rehashing of the problem, and in the rehashing of the problem, you're reinforcing that the problem is real. The right. problem is not only real, it's tangible, and it is the problem. And just like in these debates, not a single solution to anything was offered. In uh, these campaigns, no solutions are offered. Uh, I remember the debates of old and, and the platform presentations, and you would get a platform document. These are the, th these are the top 10 tenants, these are the top 10 platform points. And now everything is prefaced with an anti. This is what we're against. This right. is what we are opposed to. This is what we are afraid of. Right. And it is attack oriented and it's turned exactly as the Bible says, brother against brother, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And it is diabolical because there is no unity. No, no, and it's, it's, it's insidious <clears throat> because we now have the internet in our pocket, all of us do, and we'll Google uh, something because we want to find out, well, well, is that true, what I just heard? I Google it. But what we don't realize is that those three or four or five items that come up on Google are selected for you. Uh, there's an algorithm there uh, that Google has figured out. They already know what you're interested in because they've seen you go online before. So if you tend to be a Democrat, then Democratic solutions are going to come up or suggestions are going to come up on Google. If you're a Republican, Republican suggestions are going to come up on Google for you. And you then are only looking at the things that reinforces your fears. So then it becomes more real to you. You, you said, well, no, I Googled it. And the top five things on Google were exactly what I thought. But what we don't realize is those are being fed to you by a, a machine that's already figured out that they know what you want and it reinforces the fear. So anyone who disagrees with me must be crazy. Anyone who does, this is reality. What's coming, the top three items on Google, that's reality. And, and we, we don't know that that reality is being fabricated by 20 guys in Silicon Valley. And so when someone disagrees with me and says, well, no, I, I, I kind of think it's, it's different than that, it frightens me. I have no idea where you're coming from that's so distant from my delusional reality that I hold uh, that I can't have conversation with you. And so the, the differences between the parties now are getting the, the greatest they've ever been. There was always some overlap. I can remember working across the aisle was a good thing. And, uh, you know, I would vote sometimes this way or that way, depending on the candidate. I would look at his character and what he's done. Now people just vote party line and they're, they, they can't see the other side because they're frightened. And uh, sadly, although I believe technology is a, a wonderful invention, it has a very, very dangerous backside. It reinforces our fears. It makes us cling to and become more concrete. When we're frightened, we become more concrete. So it's not just, I feel hurt by you, it's you hurt me. You know, you're a, a, a bad person uh, for doing what you did. Not someone I can come to and say, hey, you know, when you said that, I was offended and I value our relationship, so I wanna repair this with you. No, if someone says something that hurts me, you then become on the other side. And there, there's, no, there's no room for us to talk, dialogue, to, to, uh, to repair. It, it's, 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 it is very dangerous what's going on in our culture today. And, and I think we need to have conversations about what drives what we think we know. Uh, you think you know, uh, but it's often the statements you're making are rooted in fear. And as you know, I believe underneath that is unhealed shame that never gets addressed. There are things that have happened in my life that uh, are not getting addressed. And it shows itself in my rigidity. When I know, I know someone's afraid when they talk to me and they're rigid. When they come across as 
rigid. Uh, they can't listen to anything. Uh, they're not open to anyone different than them. That rigidity gives me the cue. Oh, I see. Okay, you're you're hurt and you're afraid. Uh, that's what's going on here. And the conversation then often is not fruitful. You look at a George Floyd situation. Out of that comes the statement that America is overtaken with systemic racism. Right. So the actions of one man and a couple of com of of, of uh, complicit parties that did not intervene now paints the brush that you and right. I are right. systemically racist, and there is no margin. There is no room. Uh, we were born into it. Our history must be that. Uh, I'm not even from here. My people aren't even from here. Uh, you know, I've been alive for 25% as of you of America's history. We're not a very old country. No. And neither you nor I are systemic racists. Uh, Christianity has gone from being the Bible-believing standard to the... <clears throat> mediator of a new form of social justice and tolerance and moving away from the sovereignty and inerrancy of God to making everything negotiable, which is such a backward step into the Greek philosophical mind, which says that I am the center of the universe, if it, feel good, if it feels good to me, it's good, right, and just, and it doesn't matter. You have to make your own decisions about what feels good to you. And if what I do doesn't make you feel good, well, then you don't have to be there. Uh, you're a part of the problem if you're <laughs> not supportive of me pursuing my personal self-satisfaction right it's become uh, narcissistic uh, I, I I'm very concerned that uh, the church is caught up being caught up in this cultural shift I was uh, counseling this week with someone who's on the board of elders of a church on the west side of LA it's a very progressive area uh, and the pastor wanted to take a certain political stand. He's been preaching from the pulpit on this certain political stand for the last many weeks. And uh, finally, in the Board of Elders, they said, well, I I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that's what we should be doing. Shouldn't we be talking about Jesus? Uh, if you take Jesus out of the social gospel, is that really the message that we want? Because uh, if, if it's just about this political uh, perspective that you have, well, we don't need Jesus. We can just preach that, that politics. And he wanted to put a sign out on the front yard of the church advocating this political agenda that he had. So my client drove around to all the other churches in West LA, progressive area, and could only find one other church that had such a sign on their lawn. Uh, and came back and said, what, what are we doing? Uh, what's our focus? And he was absolutely committed to this perspective that if, if we don't do this, this is a humanitarian crisis, and if we don't address this social perspective in the way that I see it, and he, again, became very rigid and passionate about it, then we're bad. We're basically bad people. So it seems to me the church has done pretty well the last couple thousand years by just focusing on what the Bible has to say. There are brilliant psychological principles in that book. Uh, I've, all my books are written based on that. Uh, there, it's the pathway to, to know God, which is the solution to anxiety uh, in, in, our, in our world today. And if we lose that focus, which it seems uh, the, the institutional church is losing, then we're shifting the direction of becoming something else. Uh, a, a good organization doing good work, but if you take uh, the, Jesus out of the middle of it, it's something else. It's not what the church has always been. And I think there's a healing power that's being removed when we stop talking about who Jesus is. Uh, his, his focus on relationship with God and each other is the core of what heals us. And if you take that out and make it about doing good, uh, it becomes a different message.
it's, it's, it's a different message. And sadly, that message is more attractive to people in their early 20s. They're less attracted uh, to talking about who Jesus is, and they're more attracted about doing good things for others. And when we survey them and ask people in their 20s, so what's your religious affiliation? They click none. Uh, that's an, the, the most increasing category. They're not interested in the what what has been the teachings of the church up until now. They want something that's different. Uh, and I'm not sure different is always better. Uh, I, 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 I do think that, that uh, we, we need to care for the poor. Uh, but this was interesting, too. This pastor uh, had a, as one of his initiatives in the church was to eradicate poverty. And, and then the elder said, well, that's not biblical. Uh, we're always going to have the poor with us. And we're supposed to be prepared to always care for and deal with the poor who will always be there. Uh, and isn't, shouldn't that be our perspective? Uh, we, we're, we live in a, uh, the most unusual time. It's, it's, it's not what it used to be. And sadly, I don't think we can look to the church in the way we always have in the past uh, to give us answers, not, the, not the, the institutional church. It's changing. It's changing on us. You know, it's changing at several levels. The pulpit panders. The pulpits aren't preaching. They're pandering. And, you know, it's not a broad brush that every pastor is pandering, but you're, no. you, but you're no. seeing a tremendous amount of pandering, uh, vacillating on the inerrancy of the Bible, vacillating on homosexuality, vacillating on abortion, vacillating on sexual sin, vacillating on sex outside of marriage, vacillating on a incorruptible, unmovable, unshakable set of morals, values, standards, and a plumb line for transformation from the carnal to the spiritual man who then can apply those principles to how he interacts with other people. And I think that there's a responsibility that needs to be borne by the panders to say, am I going after Christianity Today's top 100 fastest growing churches, or am I going after 30 people who have a hunger and thirst for the truth of the Bible, and I am equipping them to live out the life of a believer. This proclamation that if you believe in your heart, profess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. It's a great concept. Mm -hmm. But Paul says, if you continue in your sin, you need to examine whether or not you really are of the faith because there's no sign of transformation. There is no new creation. You've made a proclamation. You have a button, a little cross, remember the club, but are you living out the life that says you can't say these things, you can't do these things, you can't treat your brother this way, you can't talk about them this way. <clears throat> You know, I told you early on in my, in my faith journey that it took five years for my mouth to get saved. It took an instant for my soul to get saved, but it took five years for my mouth to get saved. And then it took five more years for my brain to get saved to stop thinking about the things I used to say. Now I at least had the self-control to think them but not say them. It took ten right. years where I didn't think them anymore. Right. That's a transformational process. Right. And to think that this is an instantaneous change. And listen, I came into it naively. I woke up, accepted the Lord on November the 21st, December, I'm sorry, December the 21st, 1996. On December the 22nd, 1996, I got up and I looked in the mirror and I was looking for this new creation. And I was like, okay, maybe it's subtle. 
<laughs> nope, my eyes are still. I, I was looking. I was looking for what changed. Right. And <clears throat> I read the New Testament and it told me and it promised me that I was a new creation. The old was gone, the new had come. And I got a phone call from somebody, and it, it, it was a very irritating phone call. And I responded to them the same way I did the day before I got saved. And I thought, well, psh, man, I just got sold a bill of goods. It's not working. You know, it, I'm supposed to be a new creation. And it wasn't until discipleship, and it wasn't until accountability, and it wasn't until my phone began to ring and the rabbi would call, and I wouldn't say, hello, rabbi. I would say, what did I do now? What did I say now? Um, do I need to come into the office, or can we do this by phone? This was the narrative, and that went on for years because it's a process. Right. And it has to be intentional to navigate true transformation and change. Right. And like Paul, not by any stretch of the imagination have I accomplished any of this, but this I do, forgetting what's behind the last 25 years and pressing on toward the calling and the prize that waits for me of what right. lies ahead. And right. I'm seeing that the only hope that I have is that God gives me today the only day he gives me. It's the only day in God's calendar is today. I'm not promised a tomorrow. And when tomorrow gets here, it's today. So there really isn't such thing as tomorrow. Yesterday is always gone. And the only day that doesn't end in Y is tomorrow, but it's always today. Right. So if it's always today, then what am I supposed to do today? Well, right. that's, that's very freeing. Right. Think about it. I just have to do the next right thing. I have to just say, respond the next right way. Um, I live in a very short window. Um, sure, I have plans and I have dreams and I have things, the projects and things like that, always prefaced by Lord willing, I'll be able to complete them. But how am I supposed to respond to this moment? Uh, and it's a personal accountability that you're right. kept in check by allowing the Holy Spirit to be active and alive in your life and going, you better think about that before that comes out of your mouth. That, that renewing of your mind is an ongoing process. And I think this is so important right now because we're in a crisis, we're in a global pandemic. Uh, we're all in a crisis right now. And what we need now is a theology of suffering. We, how are we supposed to deal with the anxiety and the fear and the stress and the, the distress that's going on in our world? Uh, is it by considering how we can make other people's lives better? Uh, it, you know, the, the social gospel would be, well, I'm gonna help them out there make their life better, which assumes that, you know, I've got my act together because I'm going to go help someone less fortunate than I. Uh, that focus, I think, is off. You know, the theology of suffering is about transforming you. Uh, it's not about you helping other people live better lives. It's about you being a better person. Paul tells us that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, now you see how the 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 following the teachings of Jesus makes it personal for you. It's about transforming you. That if I see that suffering is not God punishing me or, oh, why is this happening to me? Uh, suffering is an opportunity. Uh, Martin Luther made this whole big thing about the theology of the cross. Maybe we've talked about this before, but he made this because it's just such a great concept. And his, his idea is that Jesus was always turning things upside down. When Jesus said something, he would like have a twist on it that other people didn't think, you know, love your enemy. What? You know, somebody slaps you, give him another cheek to hit. You know, he was always saying things that people, well, it was the opposite of what you would think naturally to think. And so Martin Luther made a big deal of 
uh, Moses being head in, hit in the cleft of the rock when Moses said, God, show me your face. And God says, well, I can, but it would kill you. Uh, so I'll tell you what, I'll let you see my backside. And so as God passes by, Moses gets to see the backside of God. Well, Martin Luther ran with that. He said, that's it. That's when God becomes most real. And when we see his backside, we can't look in the face of God. It would kill us. The glory would be too much. Uh, the, the goodness would be too much. Uh, as a human, I see God most clearly in his backside after he's passed. And his idea was, with the theology of the cross then, is, well, when is God most real to us? It's not on the mountaintops. It's in the valleys. Think about in your life, when you've prayed and you've really needed God to show up in real time for you, it's in suffering. That's when it's real. When, he, when you're having everything go right, you're grateful and you're glad. Thank you, God. I've been blessed. But he's not as real as those times of suffering. When God shows up in your suffering, when you can find God, even though it's only his backside, in, the, in your suffering, he then becomes most real. So Martin Luther was making that point that, you know what suffering is? It's an opportunity to find God. That's what it is. It's not a curse. It's not his abandonment. It's an opportunity. And we need to grasp that. We need to see what uh, times are tough, right? This, this is these are difficult times. Everybody's telling me these are difficult times. I would say it's an opportunity. If you can find God during these times, it will be your most real experience of God, M more real than any mountaintop experience that, that you could have. And if you find him there, that suffering then produces perseverance in you. Then perseverance is not patience. Patience is waiting. Perseverance is doing something while you're waiting. Perseverance is washing your face, getting up in the morning, and looking for good to do. Looking to find God in that day. That's what perseverance is. I'm looking for him today. How can I minister to someone? What's God teaching me? Where is God present in my day today? It's not about me doing it. It's about me finding God in my opportunities today. And if I live that way, seeing suffering as an opportunity to look for opportunities to encounter God who will transform me, I'll develop character. And that's how character is developed. Character is what makes you and I want to be together. It's the things about me that make you want to be with me. It's the things about you that make me want to be with you. All those characteristics of reliability and honesty, uh, those things are character. And that is only produced by people who face their suffering with perseverance. And then we learn what hope is, which is not a good outcome. Hope is a reliance on God. Uh, that, he's my hope, is that God's going to be with me no matter what. And we, if we can give that message to the people in our, around us today, that, hey, this is tough. God's not abandoned you. God's here. If we look, we can, we can find God in this suffering. And it may not be easy to see where, how he's active and how is this possibly uh, anything that God could be a part of. But if you find him there, then you'll have true hope. These are the things that produce our character. These are the things that give us what we call in psychology resilience. Um, I'm able to have resilience if I can find true hope as I persevere in the midst of my suffering. It's psychologically really sound uh, to, to give people the tools they need to be resilient during suffering times. And if we don't get that, that really the core teaching of Christianity is the renewing of your mind personally that then produces fruit, and you know, I, I want to help other people and, and help the poor, who will always be with me, and always an opportunity for me to help, uh, then we miss the point. We miss the point of the message. It's about the renewal of our minds. And that happens most during suffering, during times of difficulty. It's an opportunity to find God and to grow our character. That's a message we need to get that we can give to others during this time. We, we, the, the church plays a critical role in instilling hope into our culture today with, with uh, this theology of suffering. Uh, not that, uh, oh my gosh, we're being punished by God. Uh, no, it's an opportunity for us to find him in the midst of these times. When I look at things like <clears throat> a global pandemic, something that affects all mankind, it should be a unifier. We have a common enemy that should unify us but it hasn't it's divided us and that gets to the core of 
the shame that so many have been trying to inflict upon us and in using this as a platform for the advancement of the shame agenda, which is divisive. So, if we serve a God of love and we saw, serve a God of good, then why would he la allow a global pandemic to unify mankind around a common enemy? Right. To bring us together, to pray for each other, regardless of race or religion or national origin or whatever, that, that the rain falls on the righteous and the wicked, that we should be in prayer for all mankind. But it's fueled this separation narrative that is confusing to me. And it makes me realize that the underpinnings of faith are on trial in this season. And that if what continues to advance continues to advance and take hold, that the first thing that will come under attack are the underpinnings of faith. That Christianity, there's a referendum against Judeo-Christian values in right. this narrative. And right. if you support that referendum, then America will see Christian persecution. We will see that your wishy-washy faith and not establishing a firm foundation, you're going to be swept away in the tide because who wants to be picked on? Who wants to be singled out? Who wants to be attacked? But the fact is, is that Jesus says that blessed are those who are persecuted because of me. And so I think this is a time of sifting. I think it is a time of people coming to grips with their faith and God allowing something like this to come along and say, do you really believe? Do you really believe? Are you really grounded in my word and my promises and the pattern that I've laid out that has stood the test of time for thousands of years that the oldest documents we have, 2,200 years old, match word for word for what I have in my hand today. Mm -hmm. It's the only document that has stood the test of time without change, without error, and 50 billion copies in circulation. But my question is, why isn't that enough? And that's been my confusion about Christianity since I became a believer. Why isn't it enough? Why does there have to be, if that is the all, why am I so dissatisfied when I am the richest spiritually I've ever been in my life? I am closer to God than I've ever been in my life. I don't have great relationships on a personal level other than a very small, close-knit, my daughter, my granddaughter, you, others, a very trusted core. Uh, it's not the social life I used to live where it was different, but I'm satisfied because of the depth and the quality and the transparency and the accountability and the realness of it, that it is stable and incorruptible and trustworthy. And it's because we share a common faith. It's because we share the same standards. So when 
it's half a bubble off, when it's two degrees off, you can say to me, why don't you take a look at what you just said and the expression you just used lets me know you're, you're just a little off and, and, I, and I want to steer you back. Don't forget, and that's, a, you know, you're right. I, I've been looking, I've, I've been taking that, I'm a suspect. Uh, I have something firm to stand on. But we're rapidly becoming the minority. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, is that by design? By divine design? Because the people who are called to be set apart, the road is narrow. The path to destruction is wide and the road to salvation is narrow and not everybody is going to come on board. And is it going to require a sifting? Is it going to require a shaking? Is it going to require a testing of faith that proves out those that are willing to stand firm in their beliefs regardless of the circumstances? We have a tire 5,000 year history of those that were called to be set apart and remain set apart, but they still had doubt. Doubt was not the absence of fear. Doubt was real. Right. But they turned back to God and they found their answers. Psychologically, people are suffering <coughs> uh, it's good for business, <laughs> but your heart is not for your business. Your heart for uh, healing and your heart for right. transformation is why right. you do what you do. That's right. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Mark Baker, author of Overcoming Shame, Let Go of Others' Expectation, Embrace God's Acceptance. The concepts of can people really change is God and Jesus, the greatest therapist that ever lived. Can you put your emotions to work for you? Can you navigate a life that is in alignment with Scripture to bring you that peace that passes all understanding, even when the world is all skewed up? And the answer is a resounding yes. But so few are being reinforced by that message. And we have a responsibility to bring that message to you. That your hope is not in the next president. Your hope is not in Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden or Donald Trump or Mark Baker or Eric Walker. Your hope is in the Lord. And he's calling us to return to him because that is the only stable and incorruptible thing in our lives. And it is a clarion wake-up call to the body to return back to his word because it has never changed. We're not the first society to see this. And we will not be the last. But God's word has endured through all of that and still stands true. We're going to take a very short break, and when we come back, we're going to continue in this com conversation about confusion, delusion, despair, uncertainty, fear, and anxiety, and find out where does our help come from? It comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and my special featured guest twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops, and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black, and Sean Tabbitt for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. 
Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. And as we do on the second Friday of every month at the 12 o'clock hour, we meet with Dr. Mark Baker, author of Overcoming Shame, Let Go of Others' Expectation, and Accept God's Acceptance, taking a very balanced, biblical view, worldview, and merging it with the spiritual and psychological ramifications of the impact of the world around us and having how to navigate through it, getting to the core root of, of sin, which is shame, stepping out of that, bringing reconciliation, forgiving, and moving forward in the path that God has you, but frustrated at the same time at the messaging that the church is sending which is not consistent with the Word of God. And we have to call it out for what it is because the help you used to rely on is changing. And those that stand on the inerrant Word of God are standing firm on that Word, and that's what you need to gravitate to. Dr. Mark Baker, welcome back. It's good to be back. I think it's very important now in these difficult times that we do exactly that. We, we stand firm on, on principles that are 2,000 years old. Now, I have, I have the latest psychological training. I've gone to a psychoanalytic institute after my PhD to learn the latest psychoanalytic thoughts about how to teach people. And what I have found is that good psychology doesn't disagree with good theology. I find that healing principles are, are there and the ones that, that have been around for 2,000 years maybe we didn't fully understand them uh, and psychology has kind of flipped around and, and made mistakes and gone off in directions but they're coming back to understanding core principles of relationship that heal uh, and in and, and this time especially we need to understand what the peace that passes understanding is that you were just just talking about in the last second uh, peace is not the absence of suffering it's the presence of hope and gratitude. That kind of peace that transforms us. We need to get this. And this is just right out of, right out of the Bible. Paul says uh, that that's the core of how we, we face suffering in our life. is not to pray that God take all the problems away. That's never going to happen. But that God give us, gives us something in the, prob in the problems. He gives us grat the capacity for gratitude and hope. Paul says, give thanks in all things. He doesn't say give thanks for all things. Amen. He, he says give thanks in all things. Now that's a really important psychological distinction. It's a brilliant psychological distinction that Paul's making. That these are tough times. And Paul's not saying, well, you should be grateful. You know, I'm grateful for these tough times. He's not saying that. 
He said, you need to acknowledge the tough times as tough times and figure out how to be a grateful person in the tough times. You're in it. This is it. What can I be grateful for? I'm grateful for the love of my wife. I'm grateful for the health of my children. I'm grateful for our friendship. There are things that I have in the midst of this suffering. Am I grateful for the tough times? No. I'm grateful in the tough times. Now, that's going to make me that person of character that we just talked about and will help me understand what true hope is. There's a difference between hope and, and wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is me making up in my own mind what I think the outcome should be, and then I tell God, all right, God, this is how it should be. This is how the circumstances should turn out. Do this, do this, do this, and give me that. Take this away. Do this or that. That's wishful thinking. It's actually magical thinking, we call it in psychology. It's you making up the reality you think you want. That's wishful thinking. That's not what hope is. Hope is saying, God, I know you're going to be with me in this. You help me see the path out. My hope is in you. My hope is in the relationship I have with God. And we know this psychological principle to be true, that all difficult times are dealt with better if we do not feel alone in them. God is giving us himself in the midst of difficult times, and that's where our hope is. Now, I do tell God what my opinion is on the future. Now, I let him know, well, this is my opinion, but my hope is not in that. Because believe me, I make mistakes all the time with my opinion. What never is a mistake for me is to place my hope in my relationship, first with God and then with others. And then that transforms me, gives me the ability, gives me the capacity to find peace that passes understanding. Other people will look at me and they go, I don't get it. You know, how, how can you be so confident in these difficult times? Well, uh, I'm grateful for things in the middle, middle of it, and I know where I place my hope. My hope is my rela relationships, first with God and then with others. And that, it, that's going to transcend whatever these difficult times are. Whoever wins in November, we're going to keep going. Uh, whoever wins. We've had bad presidents before, and we may have a bad president again. Uh, we're going to go on, because I know where I place my hope, and I know what true gratitude really is. These are brilliant psychological principles that are 2,000 years old. Uh, and I think that's what we need to be teaching and preaching during these difficult times, uh, not some other political message that's going to be gone in 10 years. Uh, so uh, the gauntlet has been thrown down. I think we in the church need to pick it up and run with it. The institutions that are pumping out the next generation of pastors <clears throat> have drifted to a shifting message. Um, I deal with the chancellor of one seminary that says he's getting a lot of pushback because they are biblically sound and they're not going to change, they're not going to liberalize, they're not going to... Uh, Dr. Everett Cooper uh, wrote a book called We Are Not a Daycare, We're Not Giving You a Degree in Your Opinion, uh, so don't come complaining to me because you don't like uh, what's being taught. We teach the Bible here at this seminary and if you don't like it you can go to another seminary that teaches something else and uh, we're not a daycare. So your opinion of, really? of, of what our professors are teaching you. Uh, you've got strong voices, Dr. Michael Brown who is out there every day taking on uh, a firm, solid stand. Uh, we got yourself on a firm, solid stand and speaking life into people with the truth of the message of God. Uh, but there is a time of accountability and I think that we are in that time of accountability that, that if uh, what's predicted is one third of the churches <clears throat> that stood before the pandemic will not reopen. One third of the congregants that went wow. to church before the pandemic will not return because life went on without it and nothing really changed because mm. they didn't go to church. Right. They got the virus or they didn't get the virus. They met or they didn't meet. Uh, it, it just didn't have the value. Uh, they found out they could live without it. And so what did the church establish itself 
their role, and that's why it's coming into question. In California, you've got a pastor trying to open it, and they're trying to keep them closed. Right. right? <clears throat> uh, government intervention. Uh, that's the future look. We're getting a glimpse in California of what the future looks like. Right. And if you lose one-third support, what's left standing? Who are going to be the financial institutions who are strong enough to last this? It's either going to be the mainstream denominations of the mega churches and the local influential parish church that really did have a sense of community can't afford to keep their doors open because they lost their tithes and offerings because their people lost their jobs and right. they can't pay the bills they can't pay the pastor one third of the pastors saying they're leaving the ministry leaving the ministry we have suicide rates in ministry today that exceed any time because of the despair of who am I if I'm not in the pulpit? And I haven't been in the pulpit for seven, eight, nine months, and you've taken away everything that I am, everything I was created to do. I now am hopeless. I may never return. And so they're finding that there's no hope. Right. Well, right. if hard circumstances are going to knock you off the path, how firm were you on roller skates or were you on, you know, super glue? Um, I've had 25 of the roughest years of my life since I came to the Lord. I've lost everything twice. I gave up everything, and yet I'm going to continue to press on until Jesus returns or calls me home. Yep. Because it's the only truth that I know that will never fail me. Right. That's it. That's, that's right. You can't, they can't take that hope from you. Circumstances cannot take that hope from you. And I think that's the big message, is that circumstantial faith is not faith. Right. My circumstances are not changeable by my faith. My response to my circumstances is changed by my faith. Right. Right. And if people are looking for control and you want to feel firm and stable and sane, knowing that I have a choice as to how I respond to these horrendous circumstances, whether or not they be betrayal or divorce or bankruptcy or financial ruin, that I have a choice that I can hold firm to the Word of God and say, this will pass. There's going to be, today it's rough. This is my worst life now. I have a promise of something better, and this can only last. I'm almost 70. How many more years can it last? 30? <clears throat> I'm two-thirds of the way there. Yep. I'm on the sunny side of this thing. Right. I've, I've got less time to go than I've endured. Right. Awaiting eternity where I don't have to deal any of this. So I have an expiration date of when my troubles will end. That's right. That is hope. Right. That, that, is, that is the greatest message of hope. I know my troubles will end. Right. So I can have faith to embrace them boldly, knowing that if they don't end in this lifetime, they're definitely going to end in the life to come. That's right. That your, your best day in this life is worse than your worst day in the life to come. Amen. There's just no, no, com no comparison. There's no comparison. There's no comparison. We've run out of time, but as we always do, we um, just seem to get started. Yeah. When uh, we knock that hard message right into the narrative, but you do have the ability to change. 
uh, you do have the choice to embrace sound psychological, sound spiritual, and grounded thought patterns and uh, personal choices deeply grounded in the Word of God. And that doesn't mean you have to become religious. And, you know, I made this statement before that the worst thing that ever happened to Jesus was Christianity. I still feel that I still feel that way, that if we would have just left him alone and not created some new church, that we would have a faith that was unshakable because it would be one opinion and that's God's opinion. And that's the one that matters. Dr. Mark Baker, always powerful, always wonderful, and always too short. Always. Thank you, my friend. God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.